everybody. My Welcome. name is Kate and with me today is Chris and we have our father-son desert tortoise pair today in early celebration of Father's Day. So right beside me is Anasazi. Uh, the, he's the son desert tortoise to uh, the dad, Herkimer, right over there, who is already chowing down. Yeah. So we do want to thank you for joining us for Facebook Live, live at the Sacramento Zoo that's now open. We also want to thank our sponsor, Jiffy Lube of Greater Sacramento, who is sponsoring these live programs so we can share these wonderful animals with you guys at home. So as she was saying, we have our two desert tortoises, father and son, in celebration of Father's Day. Saucy, or um, actually Herkimer, Saucy's the son, Herkimer is the oldest animal in the zoo. We estimate him to be the same age as the zoo, about 93 years of age. So he is an old dad and he's doing a fantastic job. And Saucy, he is only about 27 years of age, so he's a little youngster, but he is considered full adult size. And these guys are California desert tortoises, so they'd be found in the deserts of Southern California. And as you can see, they have their dinner. Uh, or breakfast. These guys, they love eating their vegetables. They love having some fruit. They really love flowers, so brightly colored things. And so you can see he is just chowing down on his fruit. That's kind of a special thing that they get in their diet once in a while. Their diet is mostly made up of greens and vegetable matter because out in the wild, there's not a lot of fruit where they live. So these guys, their favorite delicacy out in the forest or out in the desert area is the cactus flower or the cactus fruit. So that's pretty exciting. Now and you'll see though, actually they're kind of picking out there by the mm -hmm. color, right? So these guys actually have really good color vision. That's really important in a desert. You picture it really kind of sandy, dirt, all that dirt, it's kind of that brown color. And then ideally those plants are gonna stand out really brightly, maybe the green of the cactus maybe the pink of the fruit of that cactus or the flower. So they're gonna like immediately hone in on that color and then go investigate. Usually they might smell it with their nose and down. Now as you're watching Herkimer eat there, you might be noticing that he doesn't actually have teeth. He's instead using that beak of his. And it's fairly sharp so that way he can kind of cut through all of that cellulose structure and plant, which is pretty durable. So he has to be able to just chomp right through it and then he'll use that nice pink tongue of his to kind of help push his food all the way back down. You'll also notice there's a lot of juice coming off like the watermelon. That's where desert tortoises get most of the moisture when they are out in the desert because the desert is very dry. There's not a lot of water. So they get it from the plants they eat such as the succulents like the cactus. And they can actually go their entire life without drinking from a stream and just getting the water they need from the fruits and the plants that they eat. Um, in fact, some of the desert tortoises they've seen where about 40% of their body weight is the water that they've stored. And so they don't actually urinate a lot. And uh, so that's one of the things is when you're out in the desert, people love to help animals out. And uh, so what they do is they want to help the tortoises cross the road. But you gotta keep in mind, you may be helping the tortoise, but he doesn't realize that. So when you pick up that tortoise, it's gonna be scared and it's going to pee. And it's gonna lose all of its water content. And there's not a water source to replace it. So just remember, help the tortoise out by maybe stopping traffic until the tortoise gets across the road. Don't pick up the tortoises. As we say, always use your eyes to watch the wildlife, not your hands and stuff. And he is just chowing down there. And that's super important too, because these animals are extremely important to their habitat. We don't want anything to happen to them. They're very kind of, of a little bit of a concern because they're such a keystone species. So as a desert tortoise, these guys are actually really good diggers. And so what they'll do is they'll use their feet and really it's kind of these long toenails, those claws on their feet, and they'll dig these really, really, really big burrows. And those big burrows, help them find a place where maybe it isn't too hot during the daytime and maybe it isn't too cold at night when it gets so cold in the desert. And so it regulates their temperature. But for other animals, it provides homes and habitats. So the desert tortoise is critical to that desert habitat in providing homes, not just for themselves, but for all of these other animal kind of fauna around. So really, really important. And that's why the conservation of them is so important. So yeah, we definitely want to leave them alone, let them do their thing, they're spreading 
hang out kind of all these seeds they're very messy eaters so that's great too all of that is really really important for that habitat and they actually will share their burrows with other animals out in the wild um, so they'll either make a burrow and abandon it and other animals will come in or they share such as like a burrowing owl because burrowing owls don't eat tortoises and tortoises don't eat burrowing owls so they can share the same house maybe there's a little section over here for the tortoises a little section over here where that burrowing owl goes to but there's one animal they will not share a burrow with. They will share with a fox. They'll share with a snake, even a rattlesnake, scorpions, Gila monsters. But they will not share with another male tortoise. Those female tortoises, come on over, girls. They'll have a party. But no other boy tortoises. And what happens, Kate, if they see another boy tortoise? Well, we might end up seeing it, considering we're pretty close. Now, uh -oh, especially come steal his watermelon. I know he's eyeing it. So especially Sazi here, as the younger male, he tends to kind of be a little bit more full of display, right? And so when that tortoise sees another male tortoise, which I'm imagining will happen at any moment now, but Sazi is really enjoying his zucchini. Let's see. They will do what's a little head bob. Are you gonna just eat it? Oh no, you're eyeing him. <laughs> Well, that was different, but they will do, it's, they bob their head. It's kind of like a challenge. And normally Sazi is the one to really like bob his head a lot and kind of challenge his dad. And then when they kind of make eye contact, they're going for each other. In this case, he's very distracted, but they will use this kind of jut of their horn, so if you, of their shell. So it's called a gular horn or a gular shield. And so if you see that jut, that's actually what they use to flip the other tortoise. And so the winner, is right side up. You probably didn't need the sound effect, but that's fine. <laughs> and then the loser is flipped over on his back, oh. which makes sense. Yeah. Okay, are we gonna see? He might do it. He's like, wait a minute. So you'll notice it's a very distinctive head motion. Oh no, he's going straight for the watermelon. He's like, I'd rather eat that, 100%. So food greater than battles, good to know. Now a fun story with these two. We have an area outside where we put them to where they can get some sunshine, eat some grass and clover, dandelions, and we have a, set, a fence that separates them. Like and a lot of people know Turkomer has this kind of weird white spot on his shell. That's actually a cat. And what happened was one day, we put them out in the weathering yard to let them be out there. We check on them periodically. Now we came out to check on them and the fence had broke or they had knocked it down. And we went and looked, and there was two upside down tortoises. So they definitely fought, but there was two losers instead of a winner and a that loser. That can't happen as well. <laughs> Sometimes it is a lose-lose situation. And that's how he got this little cast, is he got a little bit of a crack or a fracture in the shell. Now the shell is a living thing, just like your fingernail is. So it can grow and heal that fracture, but the cast gives it a little extra protection. It's like an epoxy back over here uh -huh. and uh, it so it was kind of funny and the fact that uh, they were both losers that day was pretty funny because you know a girl tortoise she's gonna be laughing at you if you're upside down flailing your legs now our questions aren't coming through I'm not quite sure why I'm not able to view them but I know a lot of people want to know when you guys were talking about the burrows do they spend these tortoises dig the burrows how often are they down underground as opposed to above ground especially in certain deserts in those really 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 hot like the Mojave Desert they're gonna be spending a lot more of their time there because it is so hot and as a reptile they're ectothermic they rely on the outside heat to kind of fuel their body heat right they they're so dependent on that so when it's cold their body heat is gonna be cold when it's hot their body heat is gonna be hot we don't have that we keep a nice normal temperature unless we have a fever and we produce our own heat by taking in calories that's why we eat so much right food yay and so for these guys by digging and creating kind of reaching a point where that that temperature is a lot more consistent and a lot more neutral so to speak they can spend a lot more time and they can survive in those harsher climates so it's really really critical for them and they do spend a lot of time especially maybe seasonally too because those deserts still get some rains occasionally and that type of stuff so that's also dependent on how much time they might spend that's your neighbor uh -huh. <laughs> they are super food motivated today yes oh there we go we see it's a little there bit of that is. head bob he did it like super casually and very <laughs> minutely there it is there we go from herkimer he's only slightly threatened 
I know. Well, he knows he's a little bigger, I'm sure. Now, Herkimer here, usually people want to know how much they weigh, and they definitely weigh quite a bit. Herkimer weighs about, he's in the seven kilos, so about 15, 16 pounds, and he's only about 11 to 12 pounds, and a stock. He's still smaller, he's still growing, but we consider them full grown. Reptiles grow their whole lives, so they're taking in food, they're shedding, they're kind of moving all those scales so that way they can grow a little bit their whole life. When they're young, they want to grow really quickly because that's when they're most vulnerable, especially for desert tortoises. Now, a lot of people want to know who's their biggest predator. Now, at this age, when their adults are fully mature, there's not any really natural predators except for humans and cars. But when they first are hatched out of their eggs, they're the little tiny tortoises. Their shells are not fully hard as they are as adults. So surprisingly, their biggest predator is birds, especially crows and ravens. They've learned that if they pick those little baby tortoises up, carry them in the air, they let go of them, and they fall to the ground and crack open. And so once they get to an age or a weight where those crows aren't able to pick them up, they're usually pretty safe. Now, these guys were on the endangered species list for a time. And so what we had done as people, we started realizing that the damage we were causing between taking them home as pets, which is not a good idea. This is actually how Herkimer came to live at the zoo. He was taken way back in the early 1900s. Someone found him in the desert and went, oh, he's really cute. Let's take him home for a pet. And unfortunately, that happened a lot back in the uh, early and mid 1900s. So you're taking animals away from the desert, as Kate was saying, which is important to the ecosystem. Then in the 70s, the peace and love time, they would paint their shells. They thought they were so pretty, they're making a message, they're carrying out to the desert. Unfortunately, that paint had lead in it. And as we said, the shell is living, and so they would get lead poisoning. So that was a big problem too. <laughs> now, speaking of the shell, a lot of people are curious because they see it on TV shows and things. Can these guys ever leave their shells behind? So oh. that's a really good question. And we actually have an example. Now, this is a turtle shell, but it, it shows the point really well. And so if you're looking, if I flip this over, you can actually see inside that shell and see this spine. And so this shell is connected. It's kind of a bony plate with keratin on top that gives it a lot of structure and protection. It's really strong. And this is connected to that spine. And so they can never kind of get away from that shell. So instead, they always have it. They're, they hatch out of that egg with it. They grow with it. And so the shell grows with them. And it might be a little bit softer when they hatch out of that shell. But then it hardens. It gets all of that nice structure. And so you can see their shells are different. They grew differently. And so it's just kind of each tortoise might have a unique kind of shell pattern or kind of specific color. But it's perpetually growing with it. So it's not like Sazi, even though he's a little bit uh, like less weight than Herkimer here, he's still gonna grow and his shell might get a little bigger. And so, but it's with him forever. No like popping out of his shell, running around without it, looking kind of like a slug with legs. No, those are just in cartoons. <laughs> and so he will always have that with him. It's really, really important for them. And so that's why they're so vulnerable too when they're little. That shell isn't quite as developed. It's a lot more kind of, it's easier for those crows and ravens to even break it and lift them up. And so that's when their most vulnerable period is. But yeah, very good question about how that shell is kind of attached to them. Yeah. He's like on a mission. Yeah, he is. He wants to steal that watermelon. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't even like turn his head. You can see he hones in on that color, right? Excellent color vision. Yeah. They definitely seem to not be into the sharing mood. Now, let's talk a little about an honor of Father's Day. Uh, most of us uh, bring flowers or gifts or whatever to our dad. Uh, it seems to me these two kind of don't quite have that relationship. No, so one of the things is male tortoises have no parental care. They just kind of, uh, they don't even see for when the female like lays the eggs. They are kind of out of the picture early. So it's not like these two ne necessarily are like, hey, that's my dad, hey, that's my son. It's not that kind of camaraderie. It's more of that competition for resources. So any other male, even if they were related, could potentially be the thing that takes food away, takes a burrow space away, especially in a desert where all of those resources are really, really critical. So typically in those types of habitats where they're a little bit harsher and resources are a little bit more scarce, maybe the families don't stay as tight-knit. 
Yeah, even the mom doesn't do any uh, parental care of the tortoise. So basically their job is to find a spot. Oh, we found each other. Oh, here we go. The great tortoise battle. You gonna stop your bobbing? There, there we go. go. <laughs> here we go. The beginning of the battle. Happy Father's Day. <laughs> yes. So that's definitely them like throwing the gauntlet, the challenge. Okay, I think I could compete against you for those resources, Bob Head. Herkimer here is bigger, but Sazi is a little bit wilier. So, you know, they kind of both lose, so to speak, when they do it. And then they would both <laughs> use that jut, that gular horn again, to kind of try and get underneath the other one. And whoever can kind of outpower the other one with that, that jut of their shell can maybe be the victor. That means they could have female tortoises in the area, burrow space, and food. Now, are they likely to come across another tortoise? How often do these battles happen in the wild? I mean, there's a lot of plate expanse and area, so it may not be as common as we see these two kind of going at it, right? They're gonna be moving, now he's like moving as quickly as possible. So instead, it, it might take time, but these guys are always walking. They're kind of always moving. They're looking for that food. And so they can cover a fair bit of ground as well. So, I mean, it's not going to be as often as they are doing like right now. And they will probably, in the wild, they would have settled that battle. Someone would have had to have moved on. Um, and Sazi everything. Too, he's ready for the shells. Sazi too, he's younger. And if you notice, his shell is a lot like bumpier. That might... One of the theories as to this might be that it can help him unlike roll himself from his back and therefore move on to a new territory and try to establish a new place should he lose to someone. Herkimer here is well established. He doesn't maybe need all that kind of ridging to try and right himself. So some of those younger tortoises, especially those males, might have some of these bumps to try and kind of flip themselves back over because they're gonna lose a lot when they're younger. Now, I know a lot of people ask us, is it um, bad for the tortoise to be upside down besides the fact of, you know, looking not so good to the ladies? I know. <laughs> it is bad to be upside down as a desert tortoise. Like he was saying, they're going to do what they can, maybe, you know, move their arms back and forth to try to, to flip themselves back over. Uh, but the problem is, one, they're in the heat of the day. If they can't flip themselves over quickly, they can get overheated and die. The other problem is, is their lungs are on the top part here. So when they're upside down, the weight of all their organs are pressing on the lungs so it's harder to breathe. So it's very important to a desert tortoise or any tortoise or turtle to flip back over as quickly as possible. Yep, I know. Now we watched them move. I heard that these guys have been clocked at two miles an hour. I know, yeah. just speed demons, right? Speedy, speedy, speedy. But they don't waste a lot of energy. Can you talk a little bit about how they spend their days and their nights out in the deserts? Like many reptiles, you're gonna want to heat up and get and get some sun to help with that body heat thing that we were talking about earlier. So for these guys, they're gonna try and pick not the heat of the day. You wouldn't see tortoises out at like noon to three. It's too hot then. But maybe in the morning or closer to the evening, they're going to come out and they're going to bask, try to get as much of that sun to get energy to get up and moving. And then because these guys are plant eaters, they're herbivores, they're going to need to walk to go get their food. And they might need to walk a lot, but you have to choose wisely when you're doing that. At night, if it's too cold, then they're not going to be able to, to keep up that body heat, keep up that energy to go get your food. If it's too hot, they could get overheated as well. That's absolutely a thing and so they have to try and maintain kind of the perfect temperature in those scenarios so while maybe the heat of the day they dig that burrow get nice and in the in between spot and then they're gonna have to choose wisely maybe they're a little bit more crepuscular or come out a little bit more at night crepuscular meaning dusk and dawn so those might be safer temperature times for them to be active and the rest of the time they might be sleeping that's totally fine they sleep a lot here at the zoo, Except for this. <laughs> here at the zoo, one of their favorite things to do is eat the dandelion, especially the dandelion flowers that are on the grass. So you guys hate the dandelion flowers on your grass? These guys love it. So we actually, in our grassy area, kick all the dandelion uh, little oh, flowers this. and stuff so they get all these flowers over there. And these guys, it's just heaven for them to go eat all those yellow flowers. And they are picky. They do like the yellow flowers versus some of the other white flowers that we have. 
Yep, they've seen each other. They are totally into each other now. Although apparently food is a bonding thing. <laughs> Like all families, fathers and sons, food is the universal. Yes, exactly. So they are enjoying their little cookout. So now, do speak. these two have individual food preferences? We talked about what tortoises in general like. I noticed that these guys seem to like their watermelon. What about them on an average day? Yeah, I mean, you definitely can tell. So Herkimer here always seems to like hone in on like the good fruit. Um, but Sabi here, the first thing he went for was broccoli. So he found those greens and went right for it. Um, it just depends. Each individual tortoise has individual preferences. We see that in other animals as well. Sometimes when they look at owls and owl cats, they find only one type of animal. So that animal has a preference. So each individual can have a preference as well, including these two. <laughs> well, we're just about yeah. out of time. We're at about our 20 minutes. Is there anything you guys would like to add about these desert tortoises? Absolutely. So we'd <laughs> like to give a big thank you to Jiffy Lube of Greater Sacramento for again sponsoring all these live segments. Uh, from us so that way we can bring the zoo to you for these segments especially for Father's Day which we are celebrating a little bit early I know <laughs> uh, so even fathers that maybe don't and sons that maybe don't quite get along it's nice that they can come together for Father's Day in this moment so I'm sure her, you guys enjoyed seeing Herkimer and Anastasi they enjoyed coming out getting some enrichment as well anything else Chris uh, just to wish you a very happy Father's Day and if you're looking for something fun to do with your son, come to the zoo and check out Herkimer, Anasazi, and all of our other wonderful animals here at the zoo. Thank you, everybody.